Good to see everybody. We are winding down. Let me go ahead. I'm going to tell you the schedule for the next couple of weeks, our last two after tonight, and then I'll remind you again before we leave. Next Wednesday, May 1st, we have been advertising that Randy Frazee was going to be with us. Uh, that week has switched. His schedule had to change, so he will be with us on May 8th for our last family matters. So you guys are going to want to be here uh, to hear from him. He is uh, a great author, communicator. Um, he's written some really good resources uh, just to help parents understand, adults understand the Bible, how to read it, how to, how to apply it. So excited to have Randy here to speak to us that night. So make sure you uh, you're here. You help us spread the word for that. But that will be May 8th instead of the 1st. So uh, just wanted to give you that, that schedule change. What's he going to talk about? He is going to talk about the greatest thing that we can give our kids or our grandkids. And not just what it is, but how to do it. So it's going um, to be really good. That's, that's kind of how we wanted to wrap up awesome. and end. Uh, we've been talking a lot about who we are as parents Last week, who are our kids? The next two weeks, we're really going to look in depth at like this role that we have in our kids' lives. Like, how do we protect them? How do we guide them? How do we nurture them? All those kind of things. Um, and so, to end with a a night where it's like, hey, if if there's one thing I give my kids before they uh, are on their own, what would that be? And that's where I wanted Randy to come speak into that. So, I think it'll be be a really good night. Well, has this class been good? Uh, has it been helpful? <coughs> Just principles. I know we've thrown a lot at you um, for 14 weeks now of content, but hopefully it's stuff that you can keep, that you can look back through. Uh, you can have conversations at home and just... Uh, use these and glean some some information from these. I hope this is really good. Would love to keep the conversation going, uh, even beyond just a Wednesday night class. So please don't ever hesitate to say, "Hey, can we circle up uh, and and talk about any of these ideas or topics or questions that these weeks have 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 brought to your mind?" I'd love for us. I'd love to spend time. I know Pastor Jason would too. Just. Um, uh, we want to be cheerleaders for you guys uh, as you as you parent. So tonight, this is a question that we get asked. Uh, this is a question that surfaces in mops on Monday mornings every month. Uh, I know mom, this is near and dear to mom's hearts. Uh, it is this question that you see on the front page. How do I keep my kids safe? How do I protect my kids in in the world? Uh, where we find ourselves today. Um, one of the things that we know about our, about our world when we look around, we don't have to look hard or very far to recognize that there's uncertainty in our world. There's, um, there's so much change. There's chaos. Uh, there's confusion. And I would imagine um, that it's very easy to... Uh, to do the opposite of what Jesus says, which is to let not your hearts be troubled. It's very easy when we look at our society to let our hearts be troubled, especially when we think about raising kids in this world. Am I, am I the only one that, that thinks that way? That, that knows that, that, you know, that those thoughts creep up and I see a few heads shaking like, yeah, that, that's true. We can move on. That's, that's a foredrawn conclusion. All right. Well, some fascinating things. I, I'm a geek about understanding generations as research comes out about different generations. The generation of kids starting like in 2013 uh, up until now, that right now they are calling that Gen Alpha. Not a lot of data yet on that generation, but the generation uh, that was born between 1995 and 2012 is a generation that we do have a lot of information on now. It's coming out. That is Gen Z. And um, what I think is pretty safe to say right now is that Gen Alpha is going to have a lot of the same characteristics because of some of the things we're going to talk about. So I think understanding some of these things we're going to look at here will actually help if you say, well, my kids are younger than this. Well, I still think some of the principles are going to be very helpful 
uh, that we're going to talk about tonight. But, but Gen Z, Jason, is, uh, is interesting. We're two generations removed from Gen Z, you and I are. It's, it's shocking, and it's, um, it, it causes issues. It's, it's funny. Yes, we, we laugh about it. Like, I, this is the first time that, you know, I feel like two generations removed from the, from the young adults. And, and I, I understand now why my grandparents looked at me the way they did when I was a young adult. Like, I don't get you. And I'm like, I don't get you. And now it's like, now I'm on that upper end of that. I'm the one saying, I don't get you. Um, but anyway, Gen Z, 95 to 2012. Do we have any Gen Z in the room? Got one? All right. Just barely, right? Just, just barely Gen Z. All right. Um, so that's Gen Z. There's 74 million of them in the United States, approximately. That's 24% of our population. Um, they're the most diverse generation in American history. They are the most digital uh, and smartphone addicted generation. That makes sense. Um, I love this. They have no pre internet memories unless you're on the very front edge. If you're in the 95, 96, you might remember a home without internet, or maybe you had the dial up internet where you heard the, you had a Juno email or AOL or something. Um, but very few, if any, pre-internet memories. They don't know a world without internet. Um, one of the things that we're going to see a little bit tonight is that generation, we could say a characterization of them is that adulthood is delayed and adolescence is prolonged. Um, you know, and that was some of the research I found very fascinating that for older generations, there was this press and this longing and desire to become adults as quickly as we could. We couldn't wait uh, for that, that freedom of adulthood. But Gen Z is not so much there. Like they want to they wanna stay in that adolescent mindset um, as, as long as they can, which is interesting. And, and real quickly, as we talk about uh, as we talk about generations and generalities, one, we're not talking about individuals. So uh, certainly, there are societal trends. That doesn't mean every person's that way. It doesn't mean your children are that way as you deal with that. Um, and secondly, as we talk about generations. Um, as with any generation, there are positives and negatives. And so we may be pointing out uh, uh, at times what seems like a, a negative bent towards a generation. And a lot of times that's just because it's surprising or that's a change from the previous generation. Uh, but every generation, because of uh, uh, cultural circumstances, has natural responses that go with that, both positive and negative. All right. So we're not in any way trying to beat up on a generation and be like, all these guys are just terrible. Um, that's not the point. The, the point is to understand uh, particular trends uh, so that way we can minister to them and, and, and really to understand the heart, right? To understand, oh, how did we get here? And then how can we preach the gospel and lead them to Christ and strengthen their walk and all of those things? Yeah, that's, that's very good. So some other characteristics, generally speaking, for, uh, for this generation. Um, they are smartphone natives. Uh, the, the, the average uh, smartphone, a child gets their, their first smartphone right now at 10. Uh, 10 years old, they, they are getting their first smartphones. Um, they are online all the time, 24 seven. Um, the research shows that they actually are spending less time working jobs, volunteering, engaging in like extracurricular activities. More of their time is spent on, on technology and online. Um, secularizing, uh, this, is, this, is, this is research that is helpful for us as the church and for, and for you as parents. One in four of Gen Z don't have any, this, some of this research comes from, it's not a Christian per se study, uh, but it was just data collecting, but they would say they have no religious affiliations whatsoever. They don't attend worship services. They're not practicing any form of just devotional, spiritual life development on their own away from a local church, but that's one in four. 
That's very high if you haven't ever uh, looked at these studies before because most people culturally in previous generations, they identify categorically as Christians even if they don't go to church, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. We, we, we go on Christmas and Easter, that sort of thing. Um, so to, for one in four, that, that's really high with no religious affiliation. Yeah. Um, they perceive one another um, through, and this is not negative or positive this is just this is just kind of the what how they find themselves they're perceiving each other through fractured bits of information think about how our gener our, our world right now through social media through technology think about how most of the time we receive information it's in short little sentences statements it's in reels it's in pictures um it's little bits and sometimes it can be uh, a, a a false reality right we make the pictures look good we put filters on them we do all of those things and right and so like just out of the gate like gen z and even gen alpha the way their brains are are conditioned is that they are constantly collecting little bits and pieces fragments of data and they are forming an understanding of who people are based on those little things without ever having like a face-to-face -face interaction with them. That's just very fascinating uh, to see how they're beginning to, to understand and form opinions and thoughts about, about, the, about people. Um, and then... And oftentimes it's a, uh, um, it, it's a fictitious world, uh, right? A lot of times the our persona, whatever we present on social media, like isn't reality. Um, I mean, super random. There, there was a recent news article I read where uh, some social media influencers rented a, a private jet for a photo studio. And, and they uh, brought about six or seven changes of clothes and went on the private jet, took all these pictures in different positions and different outfits, and then saved those throughout the year so that they can post that online. Because they're influencers, right? Oh, this is my life. This, it wasn't even their jet. They just rented it for an hour. I'm on a jet every week. I'm on a jet every week. <laughs> Don't you want to be me? Um, and then the last one, this is not a political statement when I use this. I know this is a buzzword and it can trigger. Um, but when you say Gen Z is woke, what, what we're meaning by that is some of the things that do characterize when we use that word. Um, whereas previous generations have had a little more of a positive outlook, some of the things that Gen Z have experienced have caused a more pessimistic outlook on culture. Um, they're much more sensitive to social tension uh, unrest in the world because they see it 24-7. It's, it's always there in front of them. And as a result, they're more compelled um, to protect people that they perceive to be vulnerable. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. And that's a biblical thing. That's a biblical thing, yeah. Um, but those are just some of the, there's just a sensitivity there that previous generations have not, have not had. Um, you know, and even some of what we're seeing on the news right now with uh, at universities rioting and protesting, um, the, the, the tension, the, the fighting between Israel and the Palestinians, some of that comes from that place, right? There's a perception that somebody is vulnerable, someone's being mistreated, the tension, and, they, and there is a, and the response is just to, to protest, to, um, to get out and riot over, like, this is, this is that generation, and so, that generation is, uh, some of them may be in your home. You may be raising uh, a, a very, on the very tail end of that generation. Um, but I also would think the, the, gen, the gen alpha will be, have some of these very same characteristics, at least in these early years, uh, where your kids may be right now. So what kind of challenges uh, do they face? Um, that. Gen Z and Gen Alpha, what are some of their challenges? Uh, well, we've given you some here. Um, the statistics tell us that depression is on the rise, uh, twice as much in girls as boys, but still uh, on the rise. Um, suicide rates are on the rise. Um, and I thought this was interesting, and this is really for the first time, um, like in the 90s, it kind of plateaued, uh, and we were actually seeing a decrease um, when it comes to this, but now uh, here it's, it's on the rise again. So we're seeing mental health uh, crisis uh, in, this, in this generation. 
Um, part of that is so hard to spot because technology and social media allow them to have a very optimistic and self-confident facade when deep down inside there's a lot of vulnerability and uncertainty about, about life. Um, technology is how they do relationships. That's how they meet people. That's how they communicate is, is through technology. So everything they know about connection and, and doing life, a lot of it comes from technology. Um, it is, and so we see the other, some of the other dangers of technology that, that they are facing. Loneliness. Um, one of the statistics I read said that Gen Z uh, is lonelier than our the 80 and up um, demographic who have lost, you know, friends and loved ones, right? They, there's definitely a loneliness there, but they said actually Gen Z would, ex would express that they, are, they feel even more isolated and alone. Um, and so that, that's a big deal. Uh, even though they're, the more, they're more connected than any generation ever has been, that there's still a loneliness. And then there's, uh, there's a toxic uh, nature to comparison, we would say, for all of us. If we're always looking for someone to compare ourselves to, right, the tendency for all of us is to compare ourselves to someone that we think is, has it better than us has more money than us, that's prettier than us, that is, you know, more successful than us. Uh, think about the world that they have to compare themselves to, even if it's not a real world in their minds. The comparison has really, you know, made a, taken a toll on this generation. So all that good news, right? Isn't that just great news to hear about the world in which you're raising kids? Um, it's good stuff, isn't it? Um, <laughs> not so much, but we're going to get to some hope. I promise you that we're going to get to some hope. We're setting the stage for it as we go here. So how, how does technology shape us? And this is not just for our kids. We also need to stop and think about ourselves in this too, as we're going to see tonight. But what are some of the effects that technology has on us? So I've given you three categories here. Sorry. My, there we go. Losing my microphone tonight. Um, three areas here. So the first one, um, media and technology structures our interests. Uh, what do you think we mean by that? How are our interests shaped and structured by technology? Got any ideas? Sure. Yeah. Do, does your phone adjust to you at all? Your social media? Have you ever had a, a, have you ever been talking about we need a new vacuum cleaner and then suddenly there's five vacuum cleaners on the side? Okay. What other ways, right? You, you, you chase a, a random new interest that you might have, throw one out there. <clears throat> Maybe you're looking for a laptop. Okay, uh, and you start chasing it going down that road. Maybe you, uh, you look into an interest that your, your kids are into anime or something, and then, and then suddenly there's, there's a, a rabbit trail. There's a hole like, like Alice in Wonderland. There is, there is a hole, and it can go how deep? It's, deep. it's like infinite, right? There's no end to the nonsense that's out there. Right? It's, it's anything and everything that's out there. You, if you can think of it, it's out there. Yeah, and so, and so technology, advertisers know how our brains work, and so they, they lean into this. They leverage these kinds of things. And so even if, without us even meaning for them to, like our interests can be swayed uh, and shaped uh, without our ever, ever knowing it. Um, um, even just being conditioned to just swipe, right? We just get in this mindset of just endlessly, just mindlessly just swiping and swiping. Like all of these things, right, are shaping uh, our interests. Also, um, they shape how we interpret and communicate information. How has technology changed um, how we interpret and communicate? 
What are some ways? Do what? <laughs> it depends on what news you watch. Yes, your source of it. Well, let's ask the question, let's say 30 years ago, how did you get your news? A paper. A paper. How else might you get the news? The six o'clock news. The... Yeah. Yeah, now how do we get the news? However you want. A million different ways, right? It's willing to tell you their side of the story if that's kind of your angle. And the algorithm knows that. You know that? The algorithm knows the sort of information that if you kind of click on and then and then it, it continues to spiral. The algorithm doesn't care if it's true or false news. It only cares what? Whether you click it, right? Because it wants to advertise to you. And it knows that you'll stay online longer if you keep going down this rabbit hole because they'll get your advertisement money. That's what they're selling. You're the product. So, yeah, how we communicate information. You're right. It gets smaller bites. Okay. Hashtags. What the heck's a hashtag? Yeah. 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 Yeah, text speak is what she said, right? Yeah, so th think about it. Like we, even as adults, are we guilty of communicating with emojis instead of words? Like, do we do that even? Like, we get sucked into that. Um, you know, reels, right? Instead of like telling someone, like, we're excited uh, to, to hang out or to get together for a meeting, we'll send a GIF uh, of a picture of someone that's excited, right? I mean, just the way we communicate has has changed, and some of the some of the things that researchers and even some Christian um, like people in Christian counseling and and different groups are looking at this, saying, "Hey, there is there is a there's something here we need to really watch closely because as we have started to communicate through emojis and hashtags and sound bites and reels, uh, abbreviated text kind of speech, what we're doing is we're actually our brains are less receptive to actually critical thinking uh, and and actually having to like roll up our sleeves and 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 process things uh, that are that are longer, maybe a little more complex. Like we don't really have an appetite for that in as much anymore because we get things in such rapid fire, short little sound bites. And there's like, man, and so when we want our kids to understand the word of God and we want to teach them how to think well about scripture as they get older, right? Sometimes our technology is actually going to be a, um, a hindrance for us if we haven't helped them learn to communicate outside of just the kind of the current trends and, and norms. So it was something very much to, to pay attention to. And then the last way that technology has really affected us is changing how we think about community. What what has technology done to relationships, uh, friendships, connection? When you message each other, you don't actually hear each other's voice. You see each other's faces communicating. Okay. So that damages your ability to empathize and your reaction because of this text thread. All right. So there's short form communication. What are the positives that technology has done to communication? <laughs> right? Why is Facebook a thing? Yeah, because you could keep up with your friends from high school or from your church, and even if you've moved away, that sort of things you can. You, so you can see. So you have that connectivity. We can be in people's lives, but it's all short form, right? Everything needs to be short form. Yeah. Um, some of the things that you know I think are, are super important for us to remember um, with with technology, it may you know technology may be very helpful to keeping relationships like going, but they don't replace technology does not replace face to face. Right, we still need that. Um, it is not a substitute. Um, online church is great when you're traveling or when you're sick. 
uh, you have sick kids, but it is not a replacement for being face-to-face, shoulder-to-shoulder with other believers doing life together, right? We need, we are wired, God made us for human interaction. So, you know, technology can definitely be a tool that enhances things for us when we can't have the real thing, but it can't ever become a substitute. And so that's where we've got to be careful uh, that it doesn't become where we don't have this feeling of, oh, I'm connected. I've got a thousand friends on Facebook. Yeah, so, so if you look at technology enhancing the, the breadth of connection, but it's, it's very seldom really going to enhance the depth, right? It's, it's, it's going to be pretty shallow. So we got to keep moving because I want to get to at least skim through most of what you've got here. Some of this, like I said, you're going to have to go back and think through some of these on your own. But I want to say, since we've kind of, I feel like, laid out a lot of bad news, there's been a lot of negative uh, things pointed out about kind of what we face with our kids in culture when it comes to technology and how do we guide them through it, help them navigate it. I want to give you some tips for how to parent in a technology-saturated culture. How do we do that? What are some good, just best practices for us? So we're going to go through these quickly. We may stop and talk about a few of them along the way. But my encouragement to you is to sit down and actually think through these and think through if there are action steps for how you could begin to apply some of these in your home. Like with in the context where like the age age appropriately for your kids or go ahead and be setting some things in place for when this becomes something you need to deal with. So this is there's definitely homework here for 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 all of us to do, but wanna throw these out here. So some best practices. Delay social media as long as possible. Just because it's there and they can have an account, it doesn't mean you have to let them have an account. Um Delay smartphones as long as possible. They still make dumb phones. Uh, so I know, you know, a lot of times the, the motivation for a smartphone is, well, I need to be able to get in touch with my kids if they're away from me, right? I, I need to be able to talk to them or know what they're doing, right? You can still call them even if it's not an iPhone. Uh, so go into, the, go into the Verizon store and say, give me the dumbest phone you have, right? They still make flip phones. So you could, you could still get one. And that could be your kid's first phone. It doesn't have to be an iPhone. All right, so delay that. Be the, be the parent bucking all of the norms and trends. Your kids will love you for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and let me remind you before we go any further, you are the parent. You are the parent, okay? Yeah. Um, inside the home, there's things we can do. Take control of the Wi-Fi. There are so many uh, tools and softwares out there that you can actually turn off Wi-Fi at certain times of the day. It cannot come on before a certain hour of the day, and it can be turned off at a certain hour of the day, and it can't be accessed. You can turn it off for certain devices. Like if you need to be working from home, but after seven o'clock, you don't want your kids to, uh, to be on a tablet or on a, on a device, you can turn it off for the device that they would be using. They make, tech, use technology as your, uh, <laughs> as your friend. Uh, so realize that there are, it is actually a really good thing for your home to be Wi-Fi free at certain times. It forces you to do other things uh, besides technology. Outside the home. All right, this one kind of goes back to delaying smartphones. Outside the homes, connect with your kids without smartphones. This is where use other means of communicating with them when they're away from you than just kind of falling in line and saying, well, I guess I've got to give you, you know, a smartphone now because uh, we're not together 24-7. There's other ways when you're outside the home that you can stay in contact with your kids. You just have to think, think through that a little bit. Stair-stepping technology over the years is another one. Even kind of working together. This would be a great exercise as couples to sit down and say, hey, let's map this out. Let's start with birth and let's go to 18 years old. And then let's just kind of draw stair steps and say, at this stage, 
What could they have? What would we want to give them technology related here? And then when they do well with this, they would graduate to this, right? Kind of map it out, you know, work through that with with what makes sense for for you to where anywhere even they can see it as they get older like we're on a we're on a track here as i do well and show myself responsible uh to be able to handle the freedoms i'm given then more privileges come uh but not giving them everything all at once because it can it can turn into just being too much right you give them a tool that they are just not mature enough to to handle uh, and it does put them in a vulnerable place at times, but you have that ability to, to stair step that that's an important one. Um, this is one as a former youth pastor, longtime youth pastor that I can't scream enough. Don't let their devices go to their bedrooms. Like have the charging station for the tablets and the laptops and the phones in, in your room. Uh, in the living room, somewhere that is not their room. Um, not to get too graphic, but every high school boy that I've ever sat down with to counsel who has a porn addiction, you know where they looked at it for the first time? In their bedroom, on a phone, on a laptop, right? What, you know, the most likely they're not going to do it sitting on the couch by mom and dad in the living room. Right, And so you can help them avoid temptations that they may have stumbled on accidentally, um, but then it, it, gets, it gets claws in them. So a simple, simple thing is saying, hey, guys, your bedroom, we're just not going to have technology there. That's not, your phone's not going with you uh, when you go to bed at night. You don't need it. Uh, and they go, well, I need it to wake up in the morning. That's my alarm clock. Do they still make clocks? Can you, can you still get alarm clocks? Oh, yeah. See, so just making sure they're, they're there. They're there. A um, few other ones here. This is a great exercise, especially if you've got some older elementary, middle school age kids. Write out a contract. Almost make a, uh, an agreement where you sit down with your kids and you write out, like, if I'm giving you this, here's how I expect you to use it. I'm trusting you. I'm, I'm, I'm showing that I think you can make wise choices, but if you don't, here are the consequences, right? And let them see it. Talk about it up front. That is, that's showing them, that's treating them like they're responsible and giving them an opportunity to be. So that's, that's a great, healthy exercise with older kids. Yeah, so with freedom comes responsibility. And when your child does not show that they are responsible, do you know what they do? They lose the freedom. You need to teach them that. Freedom, responsibility. They must go hand in hand. Yeah. That is your job as a parent. Yes, and this is one of the great ways to do that. Um, watch how each child responds in a digital age. Any people who have more than one child in the room? All right. Are your kids different? <laughs> Are their personalities different? Very different? Maybe sometimes making you wonder, how did you, like, how do you even have any of the same DNA, right? I mean, like, how did you come from the same place? Um, because you are so different. Guess what? They're going to respond to technology differently. Some are going to be able to handle it. Some are not. So even be wise. I mean, certain guardrails for everybody are good, but recognizing that if you have a child who has a weakness where this is concerned, like they, they get too consumed with it, too addicted to it, right? Their moods change, right? You, you start to see it based on the amount of screen time they have. You may need to know they need tighter parameters than this one. And that's okay. You know, your job is guarding their hearts. It's, it's protecting them and helping them, giving them what they can handle as their personality can, can handle it. So that, that one is super important. Um, Recentering our parenting to understand the power of affections. Basically meaning this, what has our, what captures our attention, uh, you know, draws us to it and our affections go there, right? Our job is to help our kids understand that, that one of the reasons they go to technology is because there's a belief that it can satisfy 
one of our jobs as parents is to understand that and say, wait a minute, so what do I need to help my kids understand? That this will never satisfy them. Only Jesus can satisfy the deepest longings of their heart. It's not going to be um, anything that they're going to find on, on a device. So we've just even got to think a little differently in this age, uh, which is, leads into that next one of, as parents, we've got to understand our job to disciple our kids has moved into the digital age. You know, sometimes I think our fear is there's so much out there that our kids can get to. They're vulnerable. They're not safe. The same stuff is available. The same sins are, are the temptations that we face, that our parents face, that our grandparents face, right? Temptation has not changed. Sin has not changed. The difference is it's just more readily available through technology. And so what it exposes for us sometimes is as parents that we're not watching as closely as we should be. That's more. So we've got to kind of say, all right, if we live in an age where everything is, is instantly available, then I've got to be a little more intentional with how I do what I do. I can't, I can't wait and just be lackadaisical with it. So that's what that's talking about. Let me also add, we're not just talking about obvious dangers of sexual pornography. Right. Those dangers occur in your uh, four-year-old long before then in terms of shaping the brain. If your child's brain becomes uh, addicted to uh, any time there's any sort of pause or downtime, I need screen, okay? Their mind is always running like this, okay? What's going to happen to a brain that functions that way? It's, it's going to become addicted to, uh, to entertainment nonstop. The understanding of uh, reality in the world and, um, uh, you know, just downtime, thinking, uh, all sorts of, uh, just the entire processing. So when we talk about discipleship in a digital age, it's not just watch out for porn because there's images out there that are going to get your kids. It's, it's the whole thing, okay? The number of times I've seen, uh, and I've done it, and so I'm not trying to be legalistic, but the number of times I've seen just, just a parent give a device to a child just because... Um, here, let this be your babysitter because I got to do stuff. And, and to do that for hours upon hours, like you got to understand it affects the way the kid's brain works. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah it's creating a dependency on, on that thing. Um, and so we just got to be careful, right? I mean, that's, that's, it's, there's just a, it's, it's just being careful with, with our actions uh, and how we do what we do. That's so important. Leads into the next one, redeeming time as a family. Um, speaks into that, right? You know, I know there are times that, you know, on a car ride or maybe at dinner, like handing them a tablet to play a game so that you can finish your meal. That's not, that's not a bad thing. That's not wrong, right? But if that's always what, what we do and we don't ever try to like have conversations, right? We just need to be careful that we don't, it's not always our default. Uh, so redeeming that, especially as our kids get older, Using dinner time, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Using it for conversations. Um, that is the best time to process the day as, as a family, to talk about you hear so much if you're listening, right? And it may not be our kids that are guilty. It may be us sitting down at the dinner table. We pick this up as we're eating, and we mindlessly are just scrolling through stuff that we don't need to necessarily be looking at. There's nothing urgent or pressing. We, we're conditioned to go to it. And so we miss out on hearing about things that maybe our kids would say if we just said, how was your day? What was something exciting that happened today? What was something what was something confusing that happened to you today, right? What was something that, that bothered you, right? I mean, what was something that made you happy? Just get them talking, right? That, those are those things like redeeming some of those times, whether it's dinner, car rides, family vacations, all those kinds of things, looking for those opportunities to have face-to-face -face, uh, interaction 
communication, all those things are, are so important just to counter the amount of time that even without trying, we're going to spend um, dealing with and, and technology. It's important. Yeah, if you want something super basic, every night when we sit down for dinner, we'll go around the table and we'll say, what was your high and low of the day? Yeah. That's it. There's a conversation starter. Usually takes at least half the dinner just going through. Different person, what was your high and low of the day? There you go. That's good. And if you can do that, let me. I'm going to sign you up to be a youth small group leader because that's what we do in youth, right? We, <laughs> that's a great tool uh, to get teenagers talking. What were your highs and lows today? So it's important. Um, and then the last one on here, keep building the church. What do we mean by that? Guys, our kids need community. We need community. And so prioritizing it, making sure that we are intentional about keeping our, our kids connected to, to leaders who are going to be pouring into their lives, that we are, we are creating environments where we, have, where we can have spiritual conversations with our kids. We can talk about the things that we heard from God's word. All of those things. We need it. They need it. The best place that God has given us Right to come together as believers to encourage and care and support one another is is the local church. Right, if the primary place where your kids are going to be discipled is in your home, and it is, the place that we need to be encouraged and and loved and cared for in order for us to continue to do that well, is to be connected to a local church. So don't ever we can't stop building that and being part of that. Those things are so important. All right, so we're going to move for the, the time we've got left here, looking at, at Scripture. How does Scripture, how, does, how do gospel principles help us understand what God has called us to do when it comes to this idea of just helping our kids navigate life, protecting them from some of these things that are, that are there uh, that could... Uh, make them vulnerable in, in different ways and uh, could, could create some of these trends that we hear in our culture? How do we help our kids avoid those things so that things that we say are generalities, we can say, yeah, but that's not true uh, for my kids. What are things we can do? So one passage of scripture that I think is very interesting, we know this, but this is one of those passages that Satan knows, I think, really well and uses it in a distorted uh, distorted way. Look at that. I appeal to you by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Then verse two, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Are our minds always being renewed? Are we always putting things into our brains? Are we always thinking about things? Are we always being stretched uh, processing? Are we doing those things? Do we have the ability? Does culture have the ability to do that? Can our minds be renewed um, <laughs> or changed, if you would, um, through, through technology in a negative way? Could it happen in a positive way, though? Like, are there things that we can do, like where Paul is urging the church here, uh, to not be conformed to this world, but to instead be transformed by the renewing of our minds? What, what is the difference between being conformed to the world but, or being transformed? Hmm? Okay. Don't be in the world. What's, what's the thing he says in verse 2? Don't be conformed to this world. Instead, be transformed by what? Renewal of your mind. So that begs the question, how, how are our minds, like what are we doing as a rhythm in our lives for our minds to be renewed? Like what, what would some things be that you would say would be things we could do, should be practices, habits in our lives for our minds to be renewed. Yeah. Long time without Bible study, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> it's 
spending time in prayer. Yeah. Other things. <laughs> a hobby okay sure fine yeah uh something that engages your <laughs> your brain your hands your body uh rather than just wasting time just sitting mindlessly letting your <laughs> godly friends yeah conversations um is music powerful Music is a powerful thing. Can our minds be renewed even with the kind of music we listen to? Yeah. Worship music is, you know, it can be a powerful thing just to get, uh, give us a perspective uh, that just is renewing uh, for our hearts and our, and our minds. So there's, there's lots of ways. I know some of those sounded like Sunday school, church kind of answers with Bible study, prayer, um, go to church, th those kinds of things. But guys, they, those, are, those are Sunday school answers because they're answers that work. That is how we are not, right? something, is going to, something is going to have our attention and our affections and is going to be training our minds. Right? It's just what we're going to allow to do that. Paul's press here is, hey, you belong to God. Present yourself to him as a living sacrifice. And if you are his, if you belong to him as a living sacrifice, don't allow culture to, to shape you and program you. Allow the things of God to do that. Allow his word to do that. Time with him to do that, right? Take, take that back. Take ownership of that. Be intentional with what you are feeding uh, your, your brain. Um, that, that's, that's the point here. So a couple of principles that we hit on a, two weeks ago when we were talking about our kids and who are our kids. We talked about, I mean, these are just some, these are some traits that our kids have. Two of them I thought were... At first, it's like, ooh, I don't like thinking of my kids this way. But then the more we think about it, it's like, yeah, but that is what the Bible says. And it's actually what the Bible says about me too. The one thing, uh, one principle is that we are parenting, all of us, fools. And guess what? Your parents parented fools, right? Uh, when your kids grow up and have kids, they're going to be parenting fools, right? The Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the hearts of every single one of us, right? As sinners, we, we, we have the propensity by nature to be fools. And here's the deal. The foolishness inside of us, inside of our kids and inside of you and I is more dangerous than the temptation outside of them. And only the grace of God has the power to rescue us from our, our foolishness. That's, a, that's an important principle for us to get as we are raising these kids that God has given us, as we're his ambassadors. It's so countercultural, right? Is this what our culture says about children? Yeah, it says there are these innocent little perfect little things, and uh, the only thing that, that bad could ever come out of a kid is if the environment was wrong of some sort. And uh, yeah, so, but the Bible's completely opposite. And so this is a countercultural message. Uh, so our minds have to be renewed by Scripture. It is your job as parents to instruct and to understand that there is foolishness that is bound up in your child's heart. Right. And that's the key, right? It, it's, it's a heart thing. It's not just a behavior thing. Right, it, 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 it's, 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 it's rooted much deeper than just behavior. So behavior modification is not the, the only thing that our kids need. It's actually to deal with the foolishness that's inside of them that actually produces bad behavior. Look at some, I've got a couple of scriptures here for you to see. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. Scripture gets to the heart in everything. When Jesus spoke, he spoke about the heart. Proverbs talks about the heart. Does our culture talk about the heart? 
What does it say about the heart? Follow your heart, right? Trust your heart. Be true to your heart at all costs. At all costs, right? Your heart will never lead you astray. Is that, is that true? I mean, it sounds good in a Hallmark movie, right? But is that, it's not true. What does the Bible say about our hearts that have not been transformed by the power of the gospel? Oh, that's a, that's a big pill to swallow. How dare you say that, Carly, that our hearts are desperately wicked. Where in the world did you get that? <laughs> it came out of the Bible. Yeah, it, that's, that's what God says about our hearts. Does he say that to just pile on and, and beat us down? Why would God let us know in his word that our hearts are desperately wicked? Yeah, it's, it's for our good. It's for our protection. That we have a desperately wicked heart that will run toward foolishness if we, <laughs> if not corrected. Right, and so to understand, running around your house, right, you've got a, you've got kids whose hearts are desperately wicked, who will run toward foolishness. So what are you doing, as a mom and dad, to put up safeguards to to guard their hearts? Um, now, real quick, do we mean that their that their hearts are desperately wicked in all things? No, right, they're not desperately wicked in all things. But here, we're talking about the foolishness of running towards sin yeah. and selfishness. It's, it's something that we, we all are guilty of. We would say that about ourselves, too. Um, another one that we won't take time to just go through, but the fool, where does the fool say that there is no God? It, it starts in his heart, right? There is no God. Why would the fool say there is no God? Because he wants to be God. Right? I, I, don't need, I don't want God on the throne. I want to be on the throne. I think I can do it better than he can. So there, the fool says there is no God. Um, so these, these ideas, right, our hearts need, desperately need the gospel. And so what are ways for us to parent? How do you parent a fool? Right? How does God deal with us in our foolishness um, when, it, when it rises up within us? A few things here. Just four words that I want to talk about for a minute. The first one is glory. We are, um, we have the propensity to be addicted to our own glory, to our own pride, our own interest. Our kids have the same thing, to be addicted to their own glory. What can we do as parents to help them? Introduce them on a regular basis to a much greater glory, to point them, to show them the glory of God, to show his magnificence, to show his supremacy, uh, and, and not so that they don't settle for a cheap imitation. That, that, is, that is a powerful tool that you have as a parent and that I have as a parent, is when our kids want to settle for a cheap imitation, to point them to the real thing to show them who God is when they want to substitute him for something else. Um, man, you use those opportunities as teaching moments um, to point them to, hey, you're settling, right? You're, you're settling for something that won't satisfy you. Let me point you to the one who will. Uh, wisdom is another word. Look for moments uh, to teach our kids about how God, how the wisdom of God is so far superior to the wisdom of our culture and the wisdom of the world. Right? Th these are these are great. These can be fun conversations to have with our kids as they're hearing messages that our that our world gives them to say. Now, now, what are they saying? Let's talk about that for a minute. Now, and then to point them to how does God give a a better solution? Right, using the one we've already talked about tonight. You know, well, my teacher said just to follow my heart. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. What, hap you know, what, what, what happens if we just do whatever we feel like doing? Right? Well, now, let me, let me help you see what God says is a better, a better solution. They eat candy for dinner. That's what they do if they follow their heart. That's right. Yeah, I want Lucky Charms for every meal because um, that tastes good and it feels good. 
Um, so just helping them navigate those. Those are conversations, but these are good things to do. Another one, uh, the word story, what we're talking about here, how do we help our kids deal with the foolishness inside of them? It's constantly reminding them of the story of Jesus, what he did, the person and work of Jesus. The book that I encouraged you guys uh, several weeks ago to get, the parenting book by Paul David Tripp, he talks about that. He says, Jesus came to rescue fools. Like that is the work of the gospel is that he came to rescue us from our foolishness, not to leave us in it. And right, so to remind our kids of that, like, hey, we're all there, I'm there. Like there's times in my day that I will run toward things and make decisions that I shouldn't make. I'll say things I shouldn't say. I'll chase after things that I shouldn't chase after and use my time for things that I shouldn't use my time for. But you know, what Jesus came to do was to give me a new heart and to give me a new nature and to, to, to deal with my sin problem so that I don't have to do those things, right? And you don't either, right? Just to be able to have those kinds of moments where we point our kids to, hey, everything about what Jesus came to do was to fix this thing that, that we sometimes make a mess of. Like that, that's a good thing uh, in, in how we parent and talk to our kids about these things. And then the last one, this word welcome is welcoming our kids to confess areas of their life where they start to see foolishness in themselves and to remind them that God welcomes them to bring that to him, to come to him in confession and repentance and allow him to change those things about them. That's that incredible habit to get our kids in is when we talk about an area that they need to work on to say, guess what, guys? Let's talk to God about it because he wants to hear. He wants to hear from you about this and he wants to help you with this. And he invites you to come to him with these things, right? Little things, definitely, as Jason said, this is countercultural. This doesn't just come naturally in the moment. You know, we, we don't necessarily think this way. That's why I said these sometimes are conversations to begin having uh, as as husbands and wives to sit down and, and help remind each other of, of, hey, what are some areas where maybe we need to implement this? What are some areas in our kids' lives where we know they need to think about these things? So that's what this one is. Um, the other principle, quickly, this idea of false gods. In other words, you and I are parenting worshipers. And so it's important to remember that what rules our kids' hearts will control their behavior. Um, we're all worshipers, are we not? Our hearts are all going to be drawn to, to something uh, or someone that we are looking to, that we've put on the throne of our lives. Our kids are no, are no different. And so recognizing that when we see behavior in them, that, that is... Um, that is not right, that is not good, that's not healthy, that it's not just behavior we need to be looking for, but it's deeper than that. Uh, and we need to be thinking about those, those deeper things, not just behavior modification, but what, what ha what's captured our kids' hearts. Um, and that's one of the reasons it ties into what we've talked about with technology tonight, right? Our hearts can be drawn to these things. We can get addicted to things. Um, and so recognizing that is, is so important. What does scripture say about, about the object of our worship? We've got several passages here. Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Deuteronomy 11, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. This was part of Israel's uh, regular rhythm and pattern of behavior all through their history was to turn aside and serve other gods. Yeah, but they were idiots. Yeah, so I know that's not us, right? We don't have that propensity, do we? Uh, to get distracted, for our hearts to get deceived into thinking this thing will satisfy, right? Ah. Uh, <laughs> this relationship is going to be the thing, right? If I'll just put all my efforts into this, this is going to get me where I want to go, right? We all have this ability. Um, 
to turn to this. 1 Samuel 12, 21. I love this verse. This is a convicting verse for me, but it's, it's one of those verses that just is a heart check for me. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. Right, that is a great assessment and sometimes a convicting one to say, you know, I may not be turning aside to just these blatant sinful things, but am I turning aside to empty things? Stuff that just has really no value? Like, did I sit in my recliner for 30 minutes and just scroll through Twitter and just read the most dumb, pointless stuff that is just filling my brain uh, when I could have redeemed that time and used it for, for something much better? It's standard. Definitely. Battery may be dying. All right. All right. Can, you can you hear me if I talk, talk without it? it? All right. I can, I can be loud. loud. All right. So don't turn aside to empty things that can't profit or deliver, for they are empty. Um, Psalm 115, several verses here. Um, read these on your own, but this is, again, talking about idols. Um these are just talking about idols that we will chase after and how they have no real ability to deliver the things that they promise. And so why would we let our hearts be drawn to those things? Um, First John talks about it like, hey, don't let your affections be drawn to the world. Don't love the world or the things in the world, um, but instead seek the things that are that are of God. So... We talked about how do we parent fools? How do we parent a worshiper? I think these are really, really helpful. Remembering that the capacity of the heart of your children to worship is actually meant to drive them to God. It is good that your kids have the ability to worship, that they have the ability to give their all to something, <laughs> right? God made them that way. Guess what our jobs are as parents? To not let that be directed toward worthless pursuits, but to have it directed toward him. Um, they have the capacity to worship, and that is one of the most important things for you and I to remember as parents. I think this is so true, that if there's one thing for us to remember every day about our kids is they have the ability to worship. To know God, uh, to worship God, they have that capacity in them. Uh, so to remember that so that you can begin to shape them and direct them towards him and not let that get sidetracked to other things. Um, this is a great way for us to do that. Since this is all true as parents, we've got to be committed to being instruments of seeing in our kids' lives. What do we mean by that? that you've got to point out when their worship is being directed toward things that aren't God. When they're giving first place in their lives to something that is not him, your job, my job is to help our kids see that, to, to show them, to show them that they're doing that. Be that instrument that God can use to expose that in their lives to help them correct it. We talked about this one earlier. When we see that in our lives, when our, we see that in our kids' lives, leading them to confess it, to bring, to bring that to the Lord is so important and vital. This one is, I want us to kind of finish with, we got two more here, but this is the one I want to spend a minute here on. Remember when we say that our kids are worshipers, Right at, at their very heart. It means that you and I do not have the power to free them from what could be the biggest problem in their lives. The only one who can is, is Jesus. If our kids and us, if all of us, right, are, we have our, our hearts are sinful, um, desperate need of a savior, right? We long to worship, but our hearts can be 
misdirected and we can be drawn to worshiping things that are not God. We can give our best and make priority in our life things that are not him. Right, The only one who has the ability to rescue us from that is him. And so as parents, right, every parent in the room, you love your kids. You do anything for your kids, right? If they needed something, you would, you'd move heaven and earth to make sure they had it. If you thought that there was a threat, you know, that was putting your kids in danger, what would you do? That's all. <laughs> right? You would you would remove the threat, correct? If you thought that you, there was a threat to your kids' safety, to their security, um, to just their ability to thrive, right? You would deal with it. You would step in the way, and you would you would absorb the danger to protect them from it, right? We all would, as moms and dads. Like that is because we love our kids. So if we know that the greatest thing our kids need to guard their hearts, to protect them um, in the midst of a culture that is not looking to protect them, but if we know the thing that they desperately need is a relationship with Jesus Christ, what should be the primary thing that we would, we would remove any obstacle from them being able to know and love Jesus? Right, so in our, as we parent, how much time are we giving to that pursuit? If we know that's their greatest need, how much time do we put in to introducing our kids to Jesus, to teaching our kids about Jesus, to showing them what it was he came to do, how he came to give them life, how only he can satisfy them and, and give them meaning, and, and he is the thing that is worth it. He is the greatest pursuit of their lives. All of those kinds of things. If we know that the greatest threat is inside of them, that can damage them, and we know that the only solution to that is Jesus, that ought to reorient our priorities in the things that we are, we are introducing and infusing uh, in the lives of our kids. Amen? And then the last one, I'll just let you read that one. This ought to be something that we can do naturally because it's in us too, <laughs> right? And so you and I um, have some of these same tendencies, and it's important for us to recognize them in ourselves. If we want the Lord to deal with them in the lives of our kids, then we have to give the Lord permission to deal with them in our lives as well and let him work them out of us. Amen? Amen. So, any, any, any thoughts, thoughts, any closing? closing? We've kept you guys a couple of minutes long. So, again, think through these, use these, think through action steps that be helpful in your home, uh, the stage where your kids are. And, and I would, I'd love to hear how some of these conversations go. I did give you a sheet here at the end that just has some of the better parental controls for technology, if that's something you want to think about. Uh, these are some of the more top-rated suggested ones to use, so something to explore and research when that becomes appropriate in your home. Next week, we're going to keep going with this idea of um, understanding how we shepherd our kids. Uh, we won't be looking at technology. We'll move on from that, uh, but we will be looking at, at character and, and some other really important things. So hope you come back next week for that. Uh, God bless you guys. 